Well, it's good to be back at, at Weimar. Our lesson today, as you can see on the screen, is the habits of a steward. And by the way, if you ever want a quick way to study your Sabbath school lesson, I would encourage you to put all of your notifications off and get on this little site called ssnet.org. And uh, every text, you can just click on it and boom, it comes up. And it's a very quick way of going through the Sabbath school lesson. And uh, you can even get deeper. If it refers to a spirit of prophecy quote, you can click on that and the whole book will come up and you'll be able to uh, do that as well. And uh, the, the lesson, for those of you that are visitors, um, uh, every quarter there's a new set of lessons that is studied by the World Church. And uh, so everyone, whether it's Seychelles, whether it's Africa, uh, whether it's Asia, or whether it's Europe, we're all studying the same um, aspect of the Word of God. And this particular um, lesson is on the, the, a, being a steward. There's a lot about stewardship in the Bible. Uh, but before we um, uh, get into the meat of the lesson, uh, just a little uh, report as well about what God is doing in another part of the world that I just came from. Uh, I was asked to uh, speak as a result kind of of the EQ Summit um, here. One of the um, attendees of the EQ Summit the last two years has been from the island of Guam. Guam is actually the furthest um, part, uh, at least away from the mainland U.S., that is still U.S. territory. And uh, it's out over there much uh, closer to Japan and Korea and Asia than it is the United States. So it's a, it's a large time zone and they're well known as the first part of the United States that ushers in the new year uh, since uh, they're ahead of time. In fact, um, uh, right now it's uh, not even Sabbath, it's Sunday uh, over there in Guam. In fact, it gets a little getting used to um, because in coming back, uh, yesterday uh, would have been the Sabbath and it felt like, it, to me, since I had just come from there, it felt like it should be the Sabbath uh, on, uh, on Friday because my, my seven-day clock was there. And uh, the same uh, uh, thing uh, happened uh, when I came over there. Even though I, I, I worshiped on the Sabbath, it felt like Sunday should be the Sabbath. Uh, just because of that seven-day clock. But nonetheless, uh, I didn't realize um, fully until I'd gotten there uh, what this EQ Summit attendee had arranged. Uh, on the billboards, there were flashing depression and anxiety recovery expert, free seminars. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was starting Saturday night. Uh, for the general public, um, six nights uh, that they were advertising this. Actually, it wasn't, I guess it was six. It was uh, March 10 through the, the 15th. And, uh, and so Thursday night would have been our last night. And uh, then some of the other things that she had um, started to put together and then solidified as we were there. But the first night on Saturday night, well, actually the first day, I spoke at... Um, at a tent church, um, uh, Taklub, Taj, Paklub, all right. <laughs> uh, Taj uh, Paklub uh, had been there and had done an evangelistic series, and so they still had the tent up uh, from that. And so I, I spoke on the, uh, the moral law and emotional intelligence to just our believers um, that were there and the ones coming to the tent meeting. But that wasn't advertised. But on the first uh, Saturday night before I got there, the person that arranged it said, now, you know, you need to understand a little bit about Guam. She uh, gave me all the national statistics. Depression and anxiety, you would think on a beautiful resort island, and it's very much how he just described Seychelles. It's a tourist place. That's their number one industry is tourism. And the number one ethnic group that comes to Guam are the Japanese 
and the Koreans, but also the Chinese are starting to come. And uh, however, the Japanese business shut down as soon as the North Korean leader had mentioned that he could blow up the island of Guam with his rockets um, that he's been um, testing. The, uh, the Koreans did not quit coming. Uh, the Koreans actually increased um, their, um, their tourism there, partly due to the fact is they, they've lived next to the rock, rocket man their whole life, and, uh, and South Korea is actually more targeted than Guam. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, they weren't fearful at all, and so uh, they continued to come. And so uh, uh, the, the Japanese just now are, are restarting, but, um, but there's still a lot of fear among the Japanese uh, of this man. Uh, and so uh, the tourism industry was down a little bit. But also looking at the national uh, stats, depression and anxiety rates are higher over there. Suicide rates are at an all-time high in the United States but they're 50% higher in Guam. And the country is largely run by Roman Catholics. 80% uh, of the country uh, is uh, Catholicism. And uh, they're the highest order uh, are the Sisters of Mercy. They are the ones in charge of a lot of the island. And uh, because the rates of depression and anxiety are so high, um, the, the sisters were very interested in this seminar, but they talked to the person who had come to our EQ summit, and they said, we want to make sure there's nothing about religion and there's nothing about God being taught at this seminar, because we looked him up. He's Adventist. And if you can tell me that he's not going to be talking about religion or those type of things, and it's purely on mental health, we want to come. We want to come to this seminar. And so she told me that about an hour before my first talk uh, on Saturday night. And so uh, our first night was introducing the whole subject of depression and anxiety, its complications and its causes. Uh, the next night, we're on lifestyle treatments of it, speaking of physical exercise and light therapy and, and uh, a lot of other aspects. The third night was on nutrition uh, in the brain. The first night, the, the audience, it was we're running at a Hilton hotel at the big um, convention uh, place at the Hilton. It was about two-thirds full. The second night, it was almost full. And the third night, it was standing room only. And uh, the problem of, that, um, of Guam, like some of other islands, as they mentioned, it's, uh, we run on island time. The meeting was supposed to start at 6.30, and it actually did. Um, 6.30, Erica and I would come out before the actual meeting, and Erica did a cooking demonstration in front of them uh, every night. And I actually, they even had aprons, cooking with Erica, and I was wearing this cooking with Erica uh, apron. <laughs> Uh, they also did something else that was kind of a surprise. They had uh, probably one of the best hairdressers in the world uh, come about an hour and a half before and fix Erica's hair differently every night. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I would smile at her as we were uh, going to bed every evening. It's, it was like, you know, this doesn't seem right. It's like it's a different girl every night. <laughs> uh, Erica's not one to, to fix her hair much, you know. She's, she's, kind, of, uh, she's kind of the male part of, um, of Alan and Justin. Alan and Justin, um, they do the, the one second um, hair arrangement uh, every morning, and that is they go like this and dry their hair and they're done. Uh, and um, and uh, Erica does a, a little bit more than that, but not much. And, uh, and so she, she doesn't spend a lot of time on her, uh, on her appearance and hair. And fortunately, I don't think she has to. You know, she's very, very beautiful um, just doing that. And so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't used to this arrangement. But they did it in a way where the cooking was still clean, you know. So uh, they would take it off of her neck and, and other types of things. But uh, we have pictures. I didn't put them up. I didn't have time 
like Paul did this morning uh, to put them up, but uh, if you want to see some of those pictures, I, I had to take them with my iPhone. But nonetheless, uh, we were there doing the cooking, and then uh, they said, well, there'll be more come, you know, at 7 o'clock, and, you know, and, uh, and the, the meeting hall actually opened at, at 6, but that, and then after the third night, um, they arranged for the hotel to open it up at 5, because what was happening is people were coming as early as they could to get a seat. And so at 5 p.m., the doors would open, and seven nuns would be there an hour and a half early so they could get their front seat uh, on uh, the uh, depression and anxiety um, seminar. And so uh, we, uh, we marched through. Attendance kept uh, broadening. And as it started to broaden, we started to get more invitations to speak elsewhere. Um, the, um, uh, the psychiatric hospital uh, asked me to come and put on continuing medical education for all their psychologists. We spent an entire morning doing that. The, um, the two hospitals in town wanted me to give continuing education to their physicians and to their nurses, and uh, we spent several hours doing that. In fact, they kept us so busy, we really didn't get to see the island of Guam. Uh, they would, uh, she would start lining up these things, and so they would pick us up at 7 o'clock in the morning. The first uh, time when we were there, she wanted to get more of the word out, so we were actually on radio and television. And so they were interviewing us live on radio and TV, and they have some very famous radio broadcasters over there, and they were pumping me with questions, and the television uh, people as well. So the media um, was getting uh, to, be, uh, uh, to know me. In fact, one of the radio hosts invited me back later in the week uh, when they realized I was also going to be speaking at the Women's Chamber of Commerce. There was a Chamber of Commerce, and they had a big meeting called Women in Transition, and they changed their speaker when they found out I was on the island. And that was actually the last talk that I gave on Friday that was a paid event. And after that, um, uh, and at that paid event, all of those nuns came and paid money to hear me again uh, at that time. But nonetheless, um, the final night on Thursday, I realized I can't give them all these principles without telling them about how they can have comprehensive self-control in their life. And so I uh, went through the number one problem in all the world. Some of you have heard it here. But the number one problem in all the world, and I even mentioned, I said, political leaders don't speak of it. Uh, the Republicans don't talk about it. The Democrats don't talk about it. Religious leaders will come and fill stadiums, and they won't even mention it. They'll mention other problems, but they won't mention the number one problem in all the world. I didn't mention anyone by name who goes around and speaks around the world but never mentions the number one problem. But uh, I did um, uh, introduce it and then uh, gave the convincing evidence that it is indeed the number one problem in all the world, and that is lack of comprehensive self-control. Then I spoke about how the world says that we can get self-control through temperance. And I believe in temperance. It's part of New Start. How can I not believe in it? Uh, temperance is a, is a vital part, and yes, we can learn a lot from learning about temperance. But then I told them the comprehensive fail-safe solution. And I introduced it with some texts and the Word of God. Interestingly, a, a little bit of background on this. Wednesday night, after each seminar, it would open up for questions. And so there'd be a roving microphone, and the person doing it, you know, the place is full, filled, and it's it's timed, and so after every question, she would say, eight minutes left. And after this question, only six minutes left. Who else? And so there would be this roving microphone, and so they'd be doing, counting down to, to ten uh, uh, minutes. But one of the persons that gave a, a question in the front, it wasn't so much a question, but after Wednesday night, and I found out today or that night that he was a very um, devout um, Catholic, who had given up alcohol in the last um, uh, year. And, 
And he stated that uh, one of the presentations I gave was on addiction, so it was right after that presentation on addictions. And so he, he uh, said, you know, this meeting tonight confirms what I really realized to be true. And so I'd actually quoted the Bible once or twice in that addiction seminar as well, but he said, you quoted the Word of God tonight, and he says, that's where the power is. It's in the Word of God. And I realized then that there was a controversy. I'd heard about it earlier in the weeks, being there in Guam and going to all these places. I realized the Catholic Church has a controversy there right now. And they're all taking polarized positions in the Catholic Church. But one side of the Catholic Church, that's the minority side, says, we ought to study the Bible. The Bible is okay. And the other group is saying, only tradition. Uh, and uh, the other group is saying, we're fine with tradition, but the, the Bible still ought to be studied. And so in some Catholic churches, they're actually quoting the Bible in their mass. In other Catholic churches, they're staying away from it. So that's the, that's the controversy that's going on. But as a devout Catholic, he obviously told what side of the controversy uh, he was on in that meeting. And then that, that following evening, as I introduced this topic, the Lord gave me the right words. I actually quoted from the book My Life Today a couple of times just because things are said so much better um, there than you can find them in any um, secular or scientific publication. And then I, I showed them the fail-safe solution in recognizing that self-control does not come from within. It comes from without. And we have to put all on the altar of sacrifice laid and open our heart up to God. And I gave some uh, experiences, testimonies, and also one of the major problems they have is alcohol on the island. And I've told them how nurses would say the most despicable things about the alcoholics and hepatic encephalopathy with cirrhosis of the liver who were told just two weeks ago never to drink alcohol again in their back and they're now having to fight these patients who don't know what they're doing and saying, what are we doing with these patients? No one is, they're not taking care of themselves. Why are we spending all the energy taking care of them? And they would talk about them in the most despicable ways. And I would say, I, I never viewed those patients as despicable because I realized, but for the grace of God, go I. And also, they don't know. They don't know the solution to comprehensive self-control. And I said, once they're shown, many of these individuals will turn around and never drink again. The following day, the person who asked me to come to the women's group um, had, was so excited about what was happening that week that she says, a lot of these women haven't been there. They're business people. They're very busy. They've heard about it. They want to know, can you give them just 10 minutes of each lecture? Uh, and and get, get the highlights, you know, get the 10 minutes of each lecture. But as I was sitting in the back and seeing those nuns who had been at all of those lectures, I thought, no, we need to, we need to give a new message. So I gave a message on developing character strengths, which also come from God, and I centered in on the character strength of gratitude. And the nuns, they hadn't been communicating um, with me much. They, they were, they did ask a question or two in the question and answer sessions, but not much, primarily observing. But the nuns came up to me afterwards and said, Dr. Nedley, last night when you gave that message, she says, I felt like coming up and giving you a complete hug. <laughs> she says, what a wonderful message. And she says, is there a way that we can all come to Weimar? Amen. And I said, absolutely. We would love to have you on our campus. The uh, legislature asked me to speak to the entire legislature for a legislative hearing on mental health. And while I was there, the, the head Democratic senator, who was the speaker of the legislature, who's running for governor, um, is the health senator, and so he, he came up and, and hosted um, the hour. And then, uh, uh, just prior to that, the governor had asked me for a private audience with him. 
and the governor um, uh, spent some time telling me about the problems he's having with the legislature. Uh, they're in a, in a crisis in Guam financially because their entire government is based on collecting the federal tax code of the U.S. They have the same tax code that we are, we have, but they don't pay taxes to the government. They pay taxes to their state government. And so their state government, because the federal government is such a, a big tax burden, they have a lot of government programs and government everything government hospitals and government swimming pools and government, you know, you, you name it. But with the tax cuts to the corporations, they were down already $70 million. And so there was a big crisis. What should we do? He wanted to raise sales tax. The legislature said no. And so they were going into emergency sessions. And, and so uh, I won't tell you because this is a public meeting and I know it's going out on the internet, but as I was listening to him, I said, I've got a suggestion. I said, you've probably already thought of it, so take it for what it's worth, and I'm not a politician. But here's what I would recommend. And he said, as, as he listened to it, he said, I think that would work. He said, I'm gonna call a meeting with my cabinet this afternoon, and we're gonna start working on that right away. Uh, and then when I gave the talk to the legislature, I found out afterwards, again talking to the woman who had brought us, that his family owns the number one health insurance company in town. And the number one health insurance company CEO was at the meeting that I gave. And the senator spoke to him afterwards saying, why don't we use mental health education instead of medicating all of these people? It hasn't been working all that well, but you know, Dr. Nedley has this program, and what would keep the insurance company from paying this? Well, I, I was told that he told him, we've tried wellness before, and it has never worked for us financially. So if this is a wellness program, it's not gonna work. So uh, as the meeting was over with, I was told who was the, the head of the health insurance company, and so I went up to him as he was leaving, and I didn't know he was the head, I just heard that it was a representative that was there. And I said, you know, I know I might be speaking to the, I didn't say it this way, but speaking to the wrong pay grade, because often the people that are representatives aren't the decision makers, but have you thought about offering mental health as part of your insurance services? And he went into the fact that their the amount of their insurance costs are half of what they are in the U.S., so he can only collect half of what U.S. insurances do, and they don't have a lot of reserves. And I said, do you pay for medication? And he says, yes, we do pay for medicine. And so I said, you know, think about before adding another medicine or a third medicine or a $200 a month medicine, to have some sort of stopgap measure where you say, no, we're not gonna pay for this unless someone goes through the educational program. And I said, you, you saw the response rate in the presentation. He said, I'm interested. Give me all the material you can. And so um, the island of Guam might be um, having that, that program being run uh, on, a, on a broad scale. And that could be also a lab for other uh, places as well. Uh, but uh, the Lord has moved mightily. The Guam Clinic, the one who actually brought me, it wasn't the EQ Summit attendee, she had suggested it, but it was the Guam SDA Clinic who sponsored our trip. And every night they would uh, take advantage of that, as well as they should, because they said, our mission is your health. And so every time the Guam Clinic representative would come up and say, what is our mission? And they would all say, your health in this big room. And, uh, and the SDA uh, Guam Clinic uh, brought me. And at the, near the end, the SDA Clinic was planning on, in fact, some of their people are going through training online to run the program. And then they told me, there's so many people that have signed up for this program. We're gonna, we can't do it in the Guam Clinic. We're gonna have to do it in some public location. So in May, they're gonna be running the first program, um, the eight-week program. And, uh, uh, it is um, other groups we spoke to, um, all of the school administrators and the school psychologists came together for an afternoon. 
The talk I gave him was Generation Y and Z, along with a couple of other talks and why mental illness is going up. And some of you have heard that talk in regards to technology. And one of the administrators said, we've been told that we need more connectivity, more devices, devices everywhere so that we can connect. And what you're telling us is exactly the opposite of what we have been taught as administrators and where we need to go in the future. So how can you explain all of this? And I said, well, you've seen the evidence. The evidence is pretty clear. And then one of the other school administrators who's part of the public school system said, this year I sent my own kids to a private school. And the private school that they're at is all about even more connectivity. And my kids are on their iPad all the time, day and night. They feel like they have to be for school. They're getting distracted. They have become actually far worse emotionally being in this private school. And everything that you said would happen has happened to my two kids in the last year. And now I know why. We have to do something vastly different in our school systems. And, uh, and so the Lord led. I also was asked to speak to police departments that have seen some of the most horrendous things. And um, the only disadvantage is I didn't get to see the island of Guam. We were busy all day. And, uh, but the Guam people told me, you're going to Palau next. Palau is even more beautiful than Guam. <laughs> and so you can, you can see things in Palau. And so uh, that's what we did. We, saw, we took one day off in Palau. I could tell you about what happened in Palau as well. But uh, this is just an example of how, you know, there shouldn't be just, as you know, Dr. Nedley giving seminars like this. There should be a hundred of those seminars going out. And that's precisely why I'm here at Weimar Institute, is we need to multiply the messengers by a hundredfold. And yes, it's not that, you know, uh, in fact, near the end, they were trying to say a lot of great things about me, and I would, I would always defer that and say, it's not Dr. Nedley that's great. I said, it's the message that's great. And in reality, you know, I'm not a public speaker. I'm not a trained public speaker. Uh, I'm not a very good public speaker. Uh, I'll just tell you, two of my kids are far more better than I am in their public speaking ability. Um, they've been trained more than I have, I think. But uh, it's, it's the message. It's the message. And uh, uh, this message needs to go far and wide. And we are told that medical missionary work will encircle the globe like waters cover the sea before Christ comes. And if it's not Weimar training the medical missionaries to to go around and, uh, and cover the, the world like waters cover the sea, then where else is it going to be? And so uh, that's why Weimar Institute exists. Well, the habits of a steward. Uh, if you can see here, the habit first, Matthew 22, 37. And 38, why don't we open up our Bibles to Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. The lesson had to stop there, but we know what the second. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So this is about priority. And of course, the first commandment is about priority. Thou shalt not, what does the first commandment say? Have no other gods before me. That's talking about priorities. So the first habit of a good and faithful steward is to seek God first. Now some of these other habits, in fact, why don't we just, uh, let's just um, talk a little bit about this. Uh, essentially the lesson, when you take a look at it, the lesson is going over the habits 
of highly successful people. If you want to be a steward, there are certain habits that are going to be there for highly successful people. And we might just mention that. Habits of highly successful people. And first let's mention the habits that can be present in anyone, whether they're godly or not, of highly successful people. Anyone? Time management. Time management. That's what, is that what Monday's lesson is about? No, it was Tuesday. If you can see up on the screen, habit. Use time wisely. And there are many things in the Bible. You can see those texts if you look them up. Those are the texts that talk about time management. The Bible is very particular in regards to how we're managing our time. And by the way, that's one of the problems of Generation Y and Z. They're the worst in time management. And I can tell you one of the reasons why, you know, the, the, the devil also has a problem. The devil has a problem because he needs workers in the field as well. And one of the things I've noticed is in secular scientific literature, when the devil starts realizing that his own devices are ruining his own plan, sometimes, because that's what happens, eventually the devil's plans implode on themselves. And so when his own devices start imploding on his own plan and being able to have workers, that's when you'll see secular science come out with some of the things I've presented on Generation Y and Z. It's not just a problem for God's people. Yes, it's a major problem. But it's a problem for his as well, because if they're on their devices all day, they're not going to be able to write for him. They're not going to be able to dialogue for him. They're not going to be able to press the flesh for him. And so you'll see those sorts of things come up in the, in the secular literature. There are certain things you will never find in the secular literature. And those are the things that are going to be of highly successful people that are God's stewards exclusively. So a lot of this is, is applicable to both groups. And so time management... Let's see, here we go. Time management is crucial. What's another um, habit? Uh, successful time management, what would else be another habit of highly successful people? Get up early. Get up early. Yeah, it actually is. You know, I was, um, even those in the, the um, secular business world, and I've spoken to a lot of secular business leaders. Do you know when they hold their meetings together to plan for their community and things like that? They'll hold them at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. in the morning before the rest of the town is up. They're up. They're going to bed early. They're getting up early. You'll see that pattern in every community um, that's there as far as the very highly successful. The ones you won't see it in is in the entertainment industry because they have to entertain at night. And so they can't get up that early. So entertainment leaders aren't going to be early morning people in general, although some of them will be. Um, some of you have probably heard of the, the, uh, pro, uh, uh, what many believe is the most successful quarterback in NFL history. But he's up at 5.30, he's up before 5.30 every morning, and he's in the gym working out. Early to bed, early to rise. And, uh, and it's, it's a consistent pattern of of um, getting up early, and you'll see that, in, in, you'll see that pattern uh, uh, throughout. So getting up early, did Christ do that, by the way? Yes. yes. Early to bed and early to rise is one of those. Anyone else? Yeah, physical exercise, crucial. Paul Ratsara talked about that. Needs to be part of the daily plan. And even a healthy diet. Okay. 
is a crucial aspect. And, you know, I just mentioned Tom Brady. He's very into diet. Zero caffeine. In fact, he's never consumed ca a caffeine beverage his entire life. He gave a testimony on that. And we now know that the frontal lobe is impaired. And um, he's a part of a sport where there's only one player that needs an intact frontal lobe to be successful. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, he has to analyze information and make a decision under stressful circumstances and make a wise decision. In fact, there's attempted murder going on all around him, but he has to be emotionally calm. <laughs> um, and uh, the no caffeine helps, clearly helps. And if it helps Tom Brady, it might help you too uh, in, in having to make emotionally stable decisions under distress. Um, what else? Habits of highly successful people. What's that? Okay, feed the mind, yes. So uh, we want to have the mind um, have food for it as well. So we'll just put it up there that way. Feed the mind. And there are certain ways that science has been shown to be helpful. You know, there's a big giant website called Luminosity that's trying to be there to feed the mind. By the way, they did some studies on it. Not beneficial. Uh, it's not, not degradating it, um, but it's actually not near as beneficial as they thought, playing all of these games and things like that. Uh, there are better ways to feed the mind. And it, the, one of the best ways of feeding the mind that's been shown is reading material that actually stimulates the front part of the brain. So it's where abstract thinking occurs and where there's principles combined with stories occurs. And of course that can help someone who's a secular mind, but what book is filled with principles combined with stories <laughs> that can help our frontal lobe? Uh, it's the Word of God. And so the Word of God is actually very helpful uh, in this whole aspect. What else? Habits of highly successful people. Self-discipline, Self yes. And what was said over here? Oh, same thing. Okay. So uh, let's put it down here. Self-discipline. And, you know, no matter what field you're in, if you want to excel, that's a given. You have to have self-discipline. And you know, the, any story of a sports hero, you're going to see that in there. And you're going to see extreme self-discipline in the area of their sports. You know, the baseball player that just retired, I uh, was uh, seeing what, all the things that he would do. Even while he was playing the game in his retirement year of studying the pitchers and and studying how that ball would go and doing all sorts of practice swings uh, with a video machine in the back before he got up there to the plate. All of, and and the, the, the decided effort in being able to excel was based on self-discipline. And it's, it's true in the business world. You find any successful business leader and they are going to be working hard. A lot of people think, hey, I'm going to go into business because maybe I won't have to work as hard as a doctor. Uh, I, I know very successful business people that work harder than a lot of doctors. Uh, and uh, and it is, uh, it's not the necessarily the easy money way that a lot of people anticipate it will be. Uh, and, uh, and so it requires that self-discipline. In fact, the other day I was at a conference that I wasn't speaking at, where they were talking about the ingredient to have a, a young person be successful. And you know what they boiled it down to? Yes, some of you have heard it. It's, it's a four-letter word, grit. In other words, being persistent and persistently working hard through an inner strength is what they would call it and not giving up 
And you know, the Bible is full of those examples of grit. Can you think of some examples of grit in the Bible? Joseph. Yes. Diligent. Daniel. Yes. Job. Yes. Paul. Uh, what did you say? Yeah, the widow and the judge. You have Elijah that would pray seven times, you know, and fervently, even though he knew it was the Lord's will. No one mentioned Jacob. Do you think it required grit to work seven years for one woman? And after he was through and deceived, what did he do? He repeated it. <laughs> uh, and then wrestling with the Lord all night. And that's how his name got changed. So we see a lot of honoring of grit even among the faithful. Uh, and so self-discipline, crucially important. But then there are some things, and I just uh, was given the four-minute warning. Uh, there are some things that are unique unique to Christians. They won't be talking about this as far as highly successful people. And you know, it's, uh, uh, and, and so yes, w let's take a look at this side. Maybe we can list some of them. Someone just mentioned one of them. Prayer. Pra prayer and they're, they not only prioritize, now that'll be talking about, uh, they'll talk about that over on this side too. Pri priority is, they, they prioritize with God being first. Uh, and this prayer, you know, there's, there's substitutes for it. What, is the, what does the world use for substitutes for prayer? It's meditation. Is meditation rising? Oh, yes, it's greatly rising, but there's nothing that compares with the meditation of fervent prayer. There just isn't anything. And, you know, one of the issues that we have in science, and it was brought out at our last EQ summit, who was a person who was speaking who was not part of our faith, but he did mention that conservative Christians, for whatever reason, they tend not to go into science or publications. And so there is a publication bias in scientific publications just because there's a whole element that tends to stay out of it. And, you know, the same is true in regards to journalism. You know, you don't, you don't see conservative Christians going into journalism. And so journalism is weighted all one way. And so there are certain professions that tend to cherry pick off of certain side of things. And then those professions use those same reasonings as to why to disregard the other side but it's because it hasn't been studied. I can tell you when prayer is studied, it totally blows meditation out of the water. And this is prayer where you are repeating the word of God and you are claiming promises. And then if there's a command, you are asking God if you're in compliance with that command. And you're praying out loud where it can be focused. This is something that's going to be a habit of a highly successful steward. And it's going to be unique. You're not going to see that really mentioned uh, much in the world aspect of things. The priority is God first. Any other things before we, I know we're getting ready to close. We could uh, have spent a lot more time on both of these sides. Yes. Okay. Sense of humor actually can be on both sides here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the sense of humor can definitely be on, on uh, both sides of the equation here. Uh, but in, uh, in the, the unique aspect of being a steward for God, any others that anyone else can think of? Yes, a, a student of the Bible. And spirit of prophecy. And what did someone else say? Unselfish. Yes, unselfish 
love for others. The world will talk about that a little bit, but they'll talk about it in the way of giving back. But when the world gives back, they want everyone to know that they're giving back. And in reality, it's, it's a really a, a, a self-centered giving back as well. And that's a distinct difference. Uh, where this is done as quietly as the grace that comes from a flower. And so, does God want us to be faithful stewards? Let's look at that. If we just follow that list alone and then expand it, I'm sure some of you have thought of a lot of ways of expanding that list. Each one of us can fulfill God's mission in our life. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have called us to be successful and faithful stewards. May we follow these principles with diligence. May we prioritize you. May we spend time in your word. And may we spend time in thoughtful, fervent prayer while utilizing our time and talents wisely, only putting into our body the things that will glorify you and only doing things with our body that will glorify you. And may you multiply your success through the stewards in this room a hundred and a thousandfold. In Jesus' name we pray.